Okay, today's date is March 19th, 2023. It's uh, Sunday, so I'm going to start covering some things uh, on this live stream. Uh, first thing I'm going to start with is the the obvious issue, which is my eyes better, but I still have swelling underneath here, and then the eye itself uh, doesn't have complete vision. Uh, I've lost probably 35-40% of my vision. Uh, it's it's still blurry. Everything's a blur, like a solid blur. If I look at a person, they're just a blur. There's no you know definition. And then the other issue is that um, uh, there's still pain and uh, extreme light sensitivity. So sensitivity. So as soon as the light comes in, you know it's it, it, it's irritating to the eye. So uh, a lot of people are aware of uh, the things that happen here, and I'm gonna bring this up. I'm gonna recap a lot of things real quick and make this quick. Number one, uh, I have been off the air. I've had no internet service for um, nine days now and they just came out with a new router so hackers got into the router they got into my computer they basically destroyed the router it was non-usable after they did whatever they did uh, they were deleting files on my computer but what's what's more important is I was um, trying to do documents and I was editing a document because I have to uh, do recordings um, uh, and that's why I have this. I do recordings now in the Word docs, which makes it much easier to um, put it in there. And then I go in and edit it afterwards. So I'm going to um, jump into this one here. Um, so if you'll notice, uh, let's see if it, it says a dictate function here. And then if you click on that, then it we'll start recording your voice that's how I've been doing this and then um, I'll do the best that I can and my wife will come back and she'll uh, address it um, you know trying to help with the stuff uh, so I had put this most of this together prior to my eye infection and so it took me almost I don't know several days later to take care of this uh, but I'm not a hundred percent and then just a few days ago I had uh, severe pain and the upper jaw on the right side and the lower jaw from the mold infection. The mold right now is just pouring down in here in the tent. I've got the windows open to get some airflow, but it's really cold outside. It was like, uh, I think, 18 degrees this morning uh, outside the tent and probably, I don't know, 40, maybe 40 degrees in the tent. It's pretty chilly. Um, but anyway, so... Um, I had told everyone previously that I had filed charges against various people through the uh, DOJ and the FBI and I know everybody's like yeah whatever well actually it's not whatever it's actually what we're doing uh, I'm gonna bring this up and just show it to you so I had sent this we, we sent this to obviously Lisa Monaco uh, she's the Deputy Attorney General for Department of Justice in Washington DC the uh, FBI Director Christopher Wray, uh, FBI Headquarters in Washington, D.C., Secretary of the Navy Carlos Totoro, and the VA Office of Inspector General. And this deals more with the issue of the VA in Georgia um, uh, doing nothing on my behalf about the house and the builder. So they're being kept in the loop on this. And then uh, Assistant U.S. Attorney Taylor Phillips, uh, he received this information on the 13th six days ago um, actually yesterday was, was my birthday now that I realize that but um so anyway there's still a potential of losing my left eye because the mold is still coming down it's still bad in here my right eye is now infected I still have the teeth infection the jaw infections because it's down inside the jaw so there's pain there um, my wife said I was uh, almost incoherent the pain was so bad and uh, had no control over you know the fluids or anything so this is a serious situation and the department I'm sorry the yeah the Department of Justice has been notified for months actually a couple of years about how bad this is and, and recently in the last five months it's gotten ext extremely bad in the tent and the house 
And the same thing for the court, uh, the judge over our case, Judge Hood, who is clearly biased, clearly prejudiced, refuses to recuse herself, actually walked into the, um, and I've covered this before, but I'm just kind of recapping here before I get into stuff. When she walked into the courtroom on the 13th of December, she literally waved with her left hand at John Mayer, the defendant, and then um, gave him a huge smile and, and, you know, did something a little bit childish, I think, with her nose and stuff. And and then John Mayer responded with a big bow of his head twice and smiled a huge back at her. And my wife and I knew right then these people... Um, are definitely, you know, working with each other. So recently, there's a um, a bunch of people putting together. Um, there's over 300 people now that are going to do a class action suit against John Mayer Builders, and um, they're. I think they'll have probably seven or eight hundred people here in the next couple of weeks because the word's gotten out, and people are watching my videos now, which is is going to help them understand. I'm going to cover some things here today about uh, case law and that sort of thing, and I'm not an attorney. I do not give legal advice. All I'm going to do is talk about what I've done and what my understanding of that case law is and how it applies in my case. That's what I'll be doing. And that's for anything I do. That's that's really what I'm doing. And I'm not telling people you need to do this, that, or the other. I can I will say, you know, recommend you do this and that. But first and foremost, you should always try to get an attorney, someone who has the knowledge and awareness and experience, you know, and obviously been to... Uh, school for it I've never had any training on this whatsoever so it's a struggle for me every day and then not being able to read well is a greater struggle so uh, I apologize if I have to to make a lot of these fonts very big it's uh, a requirement for me to see what I'm reading <laughs> when I say it's blurry it's blurry I don't have to go quite that big but let's see if I can get 125 yeah I think that'll work still blurry but at least I can make it out so um, so anyway um, last week on Friday someone had gotten into the computer I was editing a document and that document you can see here or maybe you can't see there's a there's an original document and then and that was I had already gone out and I was reading the next day um, I have a magnifying glass now. <laughs> I've never used that before to read. Um, I was using the magnifying glass that we had in the house and was reading the document, started reading stuff that I did not write. I was absolutely shocked. They've done it before. They just changed a word or two. They'll make a no and not and to reverse the meaning. And they'll change other words just so I'm saying that they weren't guilty and when they are. And, and I can care less what Judge Hood says about whether or not you you can claim a person's guilty. If the <clears throat> excuse me, if there's been a judgment written by the appellate court tribunal, that's a judgment. A judgment means that's their determination. So she can downplay it, she can twist it, you know, whatever she wants to do with it with the information. Uh, I could care less. Um, she is not uh, what I would call uh, an honorable. Uh, judge, um, I I think she's committed some serious moral uh, acts against my wife and I, or immoral acts, and caused us severe stress and strain, and caused us health issues that are not even beyond, not even in in society remotely normal. So um, Judge Hood is going to be held accountable for her actions against us. She superseded two different case laws there's I have five total but I only put the, the three in there recently she is not allowed to supersede a Supreme Court or an appellate court ruling I have a Supreme Court ruling and I have two appellate court rulings and both of those rulings show that um, we are entitled to what's called interim damages pending the outcome of litigation you don't even have to be in litigation I found several case laws throughout the United States with several other um, courts and cases and similar to ours, not similar to ours. It, it doesn't have to be about the same subject, in other words, construction defects. It can be about many different things. It's a matter of the principle and the law regarding interim damages. And what I discovered was astounding that 
um, in most cases, I would say 90% of those cases, there wasn't even litigation going on yet because the people were in danger. They were in uh, harsh environment, harsh conditions, and they were they were just being th they they could be threatened with some kind of you know health issue or something. I've had a severe health issue, and that's what these these images show of of my eyes. This is you know caustic. And you can see this is swollen, it's damaged, and you can see the little bubbles in there, and that's the fungus. So I have not been able to get on the internet to even see what the latest medical reports are uh, after they got copies of this. But this is excruciating. I can't even begin to tell you how bad this was. And you can see this is all swollen here, all of this. And then you'll see... Um, the swelling here you can see the mold had actually starting to get in my skin in various places that's how bad it was here you can see it here this is swollen that's a sinus cavity these are uh, cavities that's a sinus cavity that's a huge swelling in the sinus cavity I mean the pain was literally off the charts and this was the start of it um, and this was it building up to this here to where it was excruciating in this so you can see this is this was not fun and, and this was actually this was this was one day the very next day this is how bad it was and I couldn't even see out of the eye I still have that problem so the VA doctors uh, treated me for a, a bacterial infection it was actually fungal because the bacteria came back negative so essentially I didn't have any uh, um, correct support I didn't have proper medication because it didn't go away matter of fact it, it went on several days longer and I never did get any medication from the eye clinic for the mold infection and I didn't get any pain medication for the mold infection I consider that malicious when they know I'm in pain they know it's excruciating and while I was in the eye doctor's office I don't obviously don't remember it happening but I was in so much pain she was having me move my eye with the light on it and that was excruciating and I don't remember passing out I remember hearing roaring in my ears and that was the last thing I remember and then when I came to I didn't know where I was I didn't know why I was in a room and all these people were you know talking to me and saying I was going to be okay and everything and I was like you know who are these people what is going on you know because you're, you're disoriented you know if you've had one of these episodes I, I forget what they call it so um, we're under constant duress my wife and I I'm in constant pain even when I speak sharp shooting pain shoot out from my teeth and I have stacky bow trees I'm not going to show up but I have stacky bow trees and these teeth up here in the base and all my gums are receded from all the mold I have presented this to the uh, to the judge of the court and she absolutely doesn't care actually she enjoys I remember watching her read about my pain and suffering she actually smiled in the courtroom now that takes a very sadistic person who again has no morals and she has no moral compass about anything apparently you don't laugh about someone's misfortune or their pain or their suffering but she did she smiled about it so that pretty much sums it up what kind of judge we're, we're, is over our case but the key here I have a, a key witness now that notes for a fact you know I don't have the documentation uh, that's that, that person he's not willing to release it but he is I guess going to provide it if it's needed he has a document that shows that uh, allegedly Judge Hood and John Mayer and uh, couple other judges actually are in business together on on the uh, properties on building properties and selling properties and doing some other things as well some type of investments and so forth so having that knowledge and I saw the document online and saw all their names attached to that corporation I was just like wow so she failed to disclose that and um, so that in and of itself I think is breaking the law if I remember correctly 
she has to disclose that, and that means she has to recuse herself. So she made false statements. You know, she admitted to having several social interactions with um, John Mayer and his wife, and she said just brief social interactions. Well, there are a lot of key witnesses that have come forward and told me none of them were brief. They go to functions together all the time. Uh, uh, allegedly, she's been to the mayor's house, and so has Judge Martin and several other judges. They all get together. They all go to these functions together. And it's not just a festival. I mean, it's numerous different things that they go to. Um, and then there's another builder also that they get in, they're get involved with named Cody, I believe his name is. Uh, so they're all working together on this stuff. So there is a benefit, according to this witness that there is a benefit from every cell of every John Mayer Builder home to these various judges that's part of the investment. If this is true, which I believe it is, I've seen pieces of a document uh, over the network, um, then that's pretty serious, you know, alleged criminal acts by the judge, deliberately railroading me and my wife, forcing us to stay in a situation, forcing me to be harmed. Um, and then I have filed charges through the DOJ and FBI against uh, Judge Hood, but I also recently filed charges with the DA's office, local DA's office and through another court to have those charges brought forward. And the sad part is, is that uh, that judge too has now sat on it knowing I'm suffering knowing I'm in severe pain and uh, my health is on the line just like my wife's and the mold can go into the brain it actually did start to uh, this whole side of my head uh, was like hurting and then numb and then there were sharp shooting pains in the temple and so forth and in the ear it got infected inside the ear so the judges know I'm in dire straits. They know that I could perish at any time, but the judges don't care. Even the second one I filed the um, charges with, I was stunned that nothing was done by that judge. So I sent the information over to uh, the U.S. Attorney, Taylor Phillips. And let me just move this see right here. I sent this information because nobody's doing their job. Uh, the, the, the judges in the court aren't hope, are not abiding by the law, are not upholding law. I'm not going to say alleged, they're just not, okay? And judges are supposed to take action to prevent any harm, physical, you know, emotional, physical, or financial harm to anyone that's in, already in a situation there to get them out. That's, that's law. That's what they're supposed to do. And here we are several days later since I filed that that motion and that was let's just go down here I'll show you the actual date on it so that was filed on March 9th today's the 19th that was 10 days ago and you can see nothing's happened nothing's changed there's been no support nothing not from any federal government, not from the judge in the local court that I filed it with. Uh, and they're just, and this is where people say it is a good old boy network and they cover each other and that you won't see justice because the corruption is so bad, it's so deep. My wife and I really had serious, you know, difficulty believing everything we were told by all these other people. And over the last six years experiencing it, everything they said was absolutely true. So that that sums it up right there. But what's important, these, these documents will be posted later today uh, for the charges against uh, Judge Hood and um, who they were filed with. There's a lot of case law in here uh, about, you know, what's going on with the case, especially... In the conclusion, there's case law. This is important for anyone who owns a home throughout the entire United States. This is not just for Tennesseans, although I'm fighting for everyone. This is a precedent-setting case law, and this this is precedent-setting for construction defects, but not just that, for you know, uh, reforming our legislative body, reforming our laws when it comes to uh, builders getting away with abandoning abandonment of during a warranty period. 
and there's no laws to protect you. You have to file a lawsuit. That's ridiculous. You shouldn't have to file a lawsuit and allow a builder to drag this out through the court. And, of course, the builder have undue influence with the court itself and the judges. That's just unconscionable across the board, and that's what we've been dealing with. It's like we submitted 58 documented code violations, 45 documents, over 500 pictures, over 30 videos to the contractor's board in the state of Tennessee. That contractor's board is such a, a corrupt agency, and it's such a farce that it even exists, and those people are getting paid. It finally came down from Malika Bass, who's the uh, Deputy General Counsel for Commerce and Insurance at the time, which may still be, and she stated that only two of our documents, two, two documents out of 45, 500 pictures and 30 videos. The videos never showed up. The uh, 500 pictures never showed up, but two of our documents made it that were apparently heavily redacted, which we didn't do. That shows you that's tampering of evidence. The contractor's board tamper with the evidence. The attorneys for the contractor's board tamper with the evidence. They suppress the majority of the evidence and then, then redacted documents. And the contractor's board people only saw those two documents and a fraudulent, I'm not going to lighten this up for people, you know, Judge Hood and everything, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to lighten this up and say alleged every, every time when it's factual that something has happened. Now, you can sit back there and scream and holler and cry like a baby for all I care. The point is, when a engineering firm, a man that represents an engineering firm, and he's the go-to guy for the state, that's a problem in and of itself. You shouldn't be pulling the same person. Never. There's going to be an obvious bias right there. When that gentleman came out, and we have recordings of this, everything he saw was impossible. That every every code violation was impossible like no vapor barrier underneath the sill plate there's none he said he just didn't he couldn't even fathom that and then the sill plate you've got your this is your your concrete box this is your sill plate the sill plate is sitting like this and then it's canted and underneath the sill plate are shims that the sill plate's not even touching the shims and they're um half inch thick so your our sill plate's up all the way around. So what we found out from a uh, different engineering firm, SCNI Engineering, is they built these the um, sill plate is out over on the edge of the 8 inch block, it's not 12 inch, it's supposed to be 12 inch block, it's 8 inch. So the house is all the way around, is sitting on the outside edge, tearing itself apart. There's no hurricane clips holding the roof on, there's no rim joist hangers or joist hangers on the rim joist in the crawl space holding the joist together. Several of the joists are literally like three to four inches separated from the rim joist. It's just unreal. And then there's 18 um, floor joists fractured all the way down the center from one end to the other because they were overextended, I think, by three or four feet. They were too long. Um, not to code, obviously. And then um, the center pylons sank because they weren't in a, a concrete footing pad. They just put it on the, the clay and they just sank. Of course they're going to, so the house kept sinking, sinking, sinking in the center while the outsides are trying to pull itself apart. So you can see the house was never built right. Five mandatory codes not performed throughout the entire house, meaning any outlet or any light fixture that goes into unconditioned spaces has to be foam sealed around the drywall to prevent airflow from coming in from the crawl space or inside, you know, up into the walls, and then uh, or cold or warm air hitting and creating condensation. Well, we had that all throughout the house. They didn't seal anything in the house. None of the light fixtures. And we have pictures, and I've showed them before, of light fixtures with a massive amount of mold in those pictures. It was just unbelievable. And uh, Mr. Gafford, A1 Waterproofing, who who did the, the the tremendous investigations, found all these different things, which then we understood why we were getting burning on our head as we are walking underneath light fixtures and you know, just walking through the house and then stuff's coming out of the drywall. We just didn't know it at the time. And he educated us on that. So... What you're seeing here in this picture, these are the different case laws I'm talking about. Each one of these case laws shows what damages they were awarded. In our case, we're entitled to the treble damages. We're entitled to punitive damages. You know, and here's another case law for that. Because we had this happen here. In order to um, 
In order to be awarded punitive damage, you need only one of these. You'll need to meet one requirement, not all four. We, I put them in red because we qualified all four of these. So that's that's one thing to know. You only need to meet one. And this uh, this section here are the definitions basically of you know the uh, misrepresentation. And I'd have to lean forward real real close to see it, but I'm not going to do that right now. But anyway, there, that's what this paragraph down here does. You can kind of see it, but. So, I have several case laws in here for people to use for anything they need. You know, like, don't think that attorneys know all this stuff. They don't. I found that out the hard way. We spoke to a lot of attorneys. They didn't know half of the case law that I had found. And they said, well, where'd you get this? I don't, I don't know that one at all. And I was just like, wow. So, attorneys only know what they've, what they've researched or, you know, dealt with or, or, and it doesn't mean they're a bad attorney, by the way. I don't mean that at all. I'm not referencing that. I'm saying don't expect them to know all the things that I that I discovered on my own because they don't have the time to put into it that you as an individual could. And, and I think you should do your own due diligence and present things to your attorney. And if he just tells you to stop doing it and say throw it out, well... I personally wouldn't use that attorney because if my attorney's not willing to listen to me and look at things that I'm presenting. I wouldn't want him representing me. That's just me. You do whatever you want. Um, so there's a lot of good um, case law in here. Now this one is very interesting. This this case law is identical to our case. Absolutely identical. And there was a judge on this. I forget his name. Very astute judge. I read a lot after I read this one by him. I read a lot of his case laws. I mean, the man is is um, very uh, adept at, at law, you know, with the appellate court and stuff, and law in general. So these people, uh, your compensatory is your base damages. Okay, so just call it base damages. So um, you have that, and then there's consequential incidental damages, which means, you know, you could have put stuff in storage. You could have paid to move stuff. You could have paid to have damage repaired. You could have paid to uh, remediate stuff. You could have had uh, all these other added expenses. Your insurance went up. You had to pay extra money for that. Pay someone to come out and remove debris. All these different things are consequential incidental damages, which you are allowed to get compensated for. So that's what that is. So just you know just it's a whole slew of things you know it could be a rental property that you had to go rent it could be like i said you move from another state here that's covered those are incidental consequential damages so there's a lot of different things you need to look at my case law and see what's in there and all the items listed it's a substantial number of items um and then there's punitive damages and trouble damages that they received they received both so um we have that same, I mean, our case law is almost identical to this. And this section down here covers the, all this is related to that case law above until you get to the next case law. So it goes all the way down here to Mervyn Coffer. So, you know, one of the things, there was a thing in here that was very important. And I want to see if I can find it. Yeah, it's this one here. These types of damages include reasonably foreseeable consequential incident, incidental damages. And it says, in addition to damages associated with the diminution in value and cost of repairs, courts may also award all damages that are normal and foreseeable result of a breach of contract. So we have a, we have a breach of contract. No, that's obvious. Abandonment. And then we have uh, breach of warranty. Again, abandonment. No warranty was done. And... Um, we have um, fraudulent concealment, fraudulent misrepresentation. And what they're saying, this is the section of just about the foreseeable, you know, it, it's obvious, foreseeable means obvious that these would be damages they would be allowed to claim because they had to, you know, had the expenses. So anyway, you should look at this, this stuff here and see how it all ties together. And you need to understand the difference between economic damages and non-economic damages so that you understand which of those gives you uh, coverage under pain and suffering. Okay. So I'm kind of going backwards on this, and that was the conclusion. But anyway, this this was the motion to file charges against Judge Hood. 
um, with a different with a different court and for for rightful reasons again jurisdiction is not jurisdiction is not proper with Judge Hood because Judge Hood superseded two higher court binding authorities denying the plaintiff's rights and remedies therefore Judge Hood of the Chancery Court no longer has jurisdiction and she doesn't she lost it on the first denial which was October 19th of 2022 she lost subject matter jurisdiction she hasn't had it since even though she's continuing to operate that way even though I have filed separate documents and motions saying you don't have subject matter jurisdiction when she challenge it she can't say yes I do she has to actually prove that and she's never done that so that's another violation of our rights and a violation of the law so anyway this was filed to the court and then uh, that that document went over to the Department of Justice and you can see here this is the second one this might be a little too big because it's not on the page let's see if I can reduce it just a little bit that was loud sorry about that loud in my ears for sure I don't know about for you guys I don't know if I can do this yeah there we go so um, this was intentional harm to me and my wife I was the truly harm from the eye infection and I notified Judge Hood that I'd had uh, kidney pain for the last two years. I know he even notified my doctor he did nothing about it so uh, there's a complaint filed against the doctor too so they found out now I have lost substantial uh, uh, kidney function so and um, the I went and took my my blood test results and everything to a completely different doctor outside the VA he looked at it and he says, you know, and to him, looking at the overall picture in the last five blood results over the last year, um, he says it, he's suspicious of cancer in the kidney. He said, and because you've had it for two years, they should have done, I don't know how many things he, he had a litany of things he said they should have done and they've done nothing. That makes me wonder is my doctor under influence by the builder i mean he has a far reach with almost everybody we talked to they were against the builder and all of a sudden it's they're 180 and there's you know we actually had the state investigator for the district attorney's office and we have him on recordings too saying this that uh something should be done to this guy i won't say it publicly but it was pretty harsh and meaning the builder and then he meets with the builder, tells us that, and he comes back and says, building codes are stupid. And, you know, we shouldn't even have them. They're just a nuisance, and they don't do anything but cost builders money. That's what they're designed for. My wife and I are looking at each other, and we're both going, okay, undue influence. I can't imagine what it is. We can, but we won't say. That was the investigator for the district attorney's office in Franklin, Tennessee. Unbelievable. So anyway, um, this was the update to the DOJ, FBI, the U.S. Attorney Taylor Phillips, and so forth. And it covers everything in there. Again, explaining what's going on, showing the damage to the eye. And I have permanent damage here, according to this other eye doctor I visited. So um, he said even you could do try to do corrective surgery, but the damage is the scarring, the scarring that goes on. They could replace the whole cornea, but that's but you know now you don't have your natural protection this right here believe it or not this is the hacker that came in from I have traced him back to Washington State and this is the near the campus of uh, Microsoft so I believe what's happened here is obviously there's some young kid I'm saying possibly I don't know this for sure but you know I hate doing you know suppositions and uh, speculation but since it's at near the campus, I was just guessing because I'd, I'd gone through three VPN hops to find this, and this was the dead end. It didn't go any further than this. So I'm assuming this was the last hop or the actual location where this hacker was in on the computer. He was deleting like whole directories again, all over again. Uh, he had been, now this is, this is super sophisticated. He had been typing into the same document I was typing in, 
going behind me and changing things after I was past that page and going on and he made serious substantial changes and that's why up here I had sent a message in this document saying um, this note this document was, was clearly modified on the fly as Mr. Simpkins stated before and wording was changed to include Judge Johnson when the sole references were addressing Judge Hood Mr. Simpkins has revised this document only based on what he saw fixing the document this should show just how compromised the Simpkins are so I put on track changes for everything I do now. I don't. I didn't used to do that because it was unnecessary. But this actually was stated further into the document, and I don't remember where it is. But I said that very thing that while I'm in the document, they're changing things, and it really got out of control on this document. I mean, way out of control. Things that were stated in reference were just with without question. They were. Um, just ir irresponsible by this person to make you know us look bad so and then there's the this is the cover letter that went to General Kim Helper uh, complaint against Judge Hood for alleged violations of the law and it, it, it is life threatening when you have what I've learned from the doctors uh, outside the VA because the VA actually is not doing their job that's why I filed complaints there if you have uh, an ear infection that has mold in it, it's a concern because it can flare up and it can actually get outside the ear canal and into the brain. I found that out. Same thing with the sinuses. The most vulnerable places that you are vulnerable. Um, I apologize. I make noise with uh, my saliva and everything because this I have some numbness now. And my upper lip is like almost never moves when I'm talking. That didn't used to happen. And I have a uh, lack of control on the left side that I used to have. So there's some kind of some kind of um, damage to my brain from the mold because things are changing and I have difficulty swallowing. So I'm just trying to tell you how invasive this mold is and the damage already to my body and my systems. And I even said to these guys, I had a mold infection that covered the entire back of my neck and there was a big, huge, round nodule on the back left. I literally raised almost an inch and you can see it in the picture I haven't included that because it's very harsh um, but the point is is that um, it's there's still an issue there because one minute I'll feel uh, just you know exhausted and ill kind of like the flu the next minute I'll feel like I'm dying it's the strangest thing and like I have no energy no power nothing and I just want to collapse so that could be that can mean it's either in the brain and I'm, I'm dealing with that because I just finally got medication and I got medication from the VA six days after uh, I was promised I would have it overnight and that was for my doctor six days later and it just started up uh, two days ago so three days ago so that tells you I've not had su proper support from the VA clearly not getting proper support from the DOJ or the FBI uh, they're just letting these people run roughshod and rampant as far as I'm concerned uh, it doesn't seem like there's any true justice in the state of Tennessee I mean it's like a, a wild wild west free-for-all it's almost like you know since anybody can go out and do whatever they want like a builder this guy is apparently above the law because that's what they're saying and I said that to them if you do not hold the builder accountable you don't hold this judge accountable you don't hold you know all these other agencies accountable for their flagrant violations of the law and my rights that means there's no there's there is no legal system there is no justice system and it's only for the elite so that they're protected the rest of us don't mean a thing well I've got news for you people I've already said to the, every single agency the Department of Justice the FBI um, BAOIG um, the uh, district attorney's office in Nashville now this one I think it's time for everybody to, to take a step back and relook at this because if you're not going to uphold my rights and you're not going to hold these people accountable you are sending a clear message to where you will have people start responding with anarchy and if you think I'm kidding think again I'm publicizing this everywhere so everyone can see it this shows that there is there is not one single um, 
agency in the state of Tennessee, such as the Department of Justice or the FBI or the District Attorney's Office or even the court, where they're even not even remotely upholding the law, I have been violated on this computer by a virus from the opposing counsel. Whether Judge Hood wants to believe that or not, it's irrelevant. That's what happened. We have proof of it. And we that was actually supplied to her, but she stated it had no merit. Um, she also stated that he was a fine, upstanding attorney. Well, she can't do that. She cannot defend the attorney, be a character witness for him. She also said, I was trying to extort the reason. And let me back up. Judge Hood stated this exact thing because I wrote it down. I was stunned. I was astonished by her statement. And I thought, I don't know what she's thinking. But it did not end up in the transcripts. They've been either tampered with or the court reporter didn't put it in the way she stated it. But I did ask uh, U.S. Attorney Taylor Phillips to get a copy of it before it got tampered with. Those are my exact words. In, but she said in court, the reason I'm not providing interim damages for you and your wife at this time is because you're trying to extort, and she points her left arm at John Mayer, you're trying to extort $45 million out of this good man, John Mayer. This good man, John Mayer. That's not in the transcripts. I wrote it down. My wife heard it. Talked to two other attorneys since. He says, he says this is exactly what she said. But it's not in the transcripts. So I have other people saying the same thing. I have their documentation saying, yep, that's what it was said. I also have proof that the Chancery Court, the first time we were in the Chancery Court, tampered with our evidence for, in the technical record, proved it without question, showed what they, what they tampered, how they tampered, substituting pages from one document into another document in a report, a mold report, so that you wouldn't see that there was two million spore of uh, stacky bow trees in our kitchen, 960,000 uh, spore count in our bedroom, that trying to cover up the truth. That's, that's fraud on the court. That's uh, malicious intent. That's tampering of evidence. Not one person's been held accountable. Not even investigated, not even asked, no questions. This is, this, this, this is why people go nuts. This is why anarchy starts to come, up, come about. This is why people go off the rails and they start taking justice in their own hands. Because if the, the people that are in the position to, you know, support the justice in the legal system to ensure people's rights aren't violated, there's no problem. But I'm making sure everyone understands there is no legal or justice system in the state of Tennessee. This is not a joke. I'm being very serious about this. Okay, that's why I'm still sick. That's why I'm still here. I could still perish. And that's not a joke either. Just two days ago, I came close again. I mean, you have to understand, mold will kill you. The judges know this. The DOJ knows this. The FBI knows this. So what does that tell you? If they've not done anything about it, that to me says they want me to perish. I'm just saying it straight up. And if they don't like what I'm saying, then kiss my ass. Because I'm the one that's harmed. I'm the one that's in danger. I'm the one living in harsh conditions. Not them. Do your job, DOJ, FBI, DA. Do your jobs. So, going back to what's happened here on the aspect of the the router. So, I just got a new router today. You should have seen the technician's face. We hadn't been up for a minute. And the router goes down. I can't access it. He can't. And he was in there checking all the data. He goes, that's never happened before. I already knew what happened. So he's trying to get it back online. He's trying to connect with it. Can't connect. So we go in the house, which you don't want to do because it's so bad in there. We have to hit the reset button. Reset everything. So the what happened was when you get a new router, they keep the old router's information and then overwrite that information onto the current router, meaning whatever name you had in there publicized and whatever passwords you had in there for device access or the passwords for the being able to log in through the internet, all that's copied back down in there. So they they already had all that information. I said you don't want to do that. So 
that's a that's a piss poor policy. That's not something a policy you should have because if you're being violated by somebody already and then you reload that stuff in there, they're just sitting there waiting, and they were, because they could see his vehicle out here, so they knew, oh, get ready, because they're back here in one of these houses, watching us. So, they took it down again, took the router right out of service. He couldn't believe it, so we had to revamp it, and then. It reloaded the stuff again, and we were in there trying to change it. It was too late. They were already in there, and they changed the passwords, and everything locked us right out. I mean, we just, he couldn't believe it. So he got it to working, and they stopped messing with it. But as soon as he drove off, I came back into the tent, sat down here. I had no Internet connection. So I had to go get the, the router, the brand-new router, bring it out here, hook it up directly to the computer, change everything in the in the router, you know, and I couldn't even connect to it at first. So I had to get tech support on to figure out what the problem was. And they they finally figured it out. And they had made some changes where you can't change the router. At, there's 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz. They can't have different names in the new software update on these routers. They used to be able to do that, but not anymore. So there was two different names in there, which doesn't allow the, the thing to... Um, Two different names. I'm sorry. One for the 2.4 gigahertz, one for the two, or for the five, and each one had its own password. And they said you can't do that, so you you couldn't log in. So then on my computer they found that they had uh, changed in the the properties of the uh, Wi-Fi unit to only look for 2.4 gigahertz. So if if they if they've limited you to 2.4, which is a very low bandwidth, that means you can't even, you'll never get access to the 5, even if you try to log into the 5, it will prevent it because the preference and, and the only option was for 2.4, and in the, in the router itself, they had turned off the 5 gigahertz. So again, all these things that they know how to do. So I, I learned more about the router today, so that's... I mean, it, it's a never-ending harassment, never-ending. People still come by the tent, holler at me. Just the other day, some woman said something really stupid, and I bit her head off because you know. And I and I'm not like that, you know. But I just said, you know, that's just inappropriate. I said, I'm glad to see that your your parents <laughs> raised you with manners, being obviously very sarcastic. So, um, so there's that. So obviously I have the router working now because I'm live streaming, but who knows how long that's going to last before they break in and take it down offline again. But this is an ongoing, you know, situation. It's it's a never-ending situation. Like I said, it's it's constantly repetitive. So I wanted to jump back into. Um, let me just pull this up here. I'm going to jump into something here from. I think I need the, here we go. So this was from uh, November 7th, 2022. And if I remember correctly, it doesn't work from this level. Oh, it did work, okay. So I'm gonna jump down here into this real quick. I was being very nice to, to Judge Hood throughout the process because I just, in my mind, I was thinking she probably hasn't read everything. She probably doesn't understand mold and mycotoxins. She probably doesn't understand half of what's going on here. So it's my job to educate her. So I was going through that process and telling her this is what I had, ketoacidosis, okay? And this is these are all the different things that cause it. Well, I've got high ketones in my bloodstream. I've got carbolic acids in the urine so you got all these problems and you know you're down 40 percent in one month from blood tests before to now that's a serious drop that's a serious concerning issue which is why the outside doctor that I went and brought everything to him and got an appointment with says it looks like cancer to him because that's exactly that's your starting process like in one month you'll drop considerably and that means you've got serious problems 
the VA has refused, my doctor at the VA has refused to look or do any other testing of the kidney because the parameters were all within the norms. A little, little high, a little low, here and there. But he said if it's high or low on these two things alone, that says you got to do further investigation, which means possible undue influence. Again, you just don't know. Um, so this is Mr. Gafford's report, and this is where I wanted to get into this. He gave the legal definitions in his, uh, I think this is October 30th, 2020 report. This was one of the things that I was unaware of. I didn't even know where to get this. But if you look at this, incompetency, um, it says the lack of ability, knowledge, legal qualification, or fitness to discharge re a required duty or professional obligation. And so now we're going to go to gross, uh, I'm sorry, not gross, but negligence. Conduct that falls below the standards of behavior established by law for the protection of others. No, it just falls below the standards, okay, against unreasonable risk of harm. So this is, he said, this is way beyond unreasonable risk of harm. This is knowing I'll be harmed. The environment I'm in, my wife's in, the judge knows I'll be harmed, knows my wife will be harmed. He says, and by that, she's automatically held accountable, should be held accountable to the law for any injury or damage so I've got I've lost like 30 percent of my eye from what the eye doctor looked at so and um he doesn't know he's got to wait for it to settle for the infection to leave and the infection's still going on <clears throat> both in the left eye and now the right and you can see the swelling still down in the, the sinus cavity underneath here so <clears throat> until I'm out of the situation it will continue and then a person has acted negligently if he or she has departed from the conduct expected of a reasonably prudent person acting under similar circumstances. There's nothing reasonably prudent about the behavior of um, a court judge who knows they're harming someone and continues to do so even after receiving notification that the individual has been severely harmed. Even after knowing that. Gross negligence and indifference to an a blatant violation of a legal duty with respect to the rights of others. Well, Judge Hood has definitely met that requirement and 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 broken that that vow of upholding the law. That's crystal clear to me. It should be crystal clear clear to anyone else. So I'm not going to go through, read all this stuff here. I can't. Anyway, some of this is so small, it's just a blur to me. Um, but this document is out there. It's on the first recording I did, the 211 recording. And there's links to all these different documents. It's important that you get these kind of reports downloaded because they're very comprehensive. And it helps you understand what you need to look for and what when you hire someone what they should be looking for mr gafford is an absolute expert at this and now i'm i was classified i forget the lady's name at the state she said i'm classified as a mold expert now as well as from the um um what do you call it national institute of health the scientists there said i, I know on a comprehensive level, a much deeper comprehensive level, how all everything ties together. I've proven that certain molds, which they already did studies on, but certain molds cause incontinence. I've proved that certain molds cause lupus, uh, uh, cause Crohn's disease, um, uh, diverticulitis, irritable bowel syndrome, um, numerous things. Uh, the list goes on and on. Because I and my wife have experienced all of these things and more. Just like this is really burning now, unfortunately. So I have to put an eye patch on because now it's, um, it's getting the pains in there. And when it comes on, it's sudden. So I'll have to get an eye patch on that very soon. Um, so anyway, I, I highly recommend you pull the report down and read through it. Uh, it's important to understand... Uh, numerous things that happened in this property which called a, caused a cascading effect uh, prior to us buying the property. So the dishwasher has a sensor pan that has to be installed otherwise it doesn't know to shut the dishwasher off 
and it can overflow and it was holding water in that water because it wasn't discharging out through uh, the garbage disposal unit because the knockout plug wasn't knocked out. I didn't even know dishwashers discharged through a garbage disposal unit until this happened. In my mind, for whatever reason, you know, being an engineer, logically thinking, oh, it's going to discharge out through, you know, some pipe into the plumbing system. Nope, it it goes through the garbage disposal. So it couldn't, so it was overflowing for weeks before we bought the house because we found... Uh, uh, Mr. Garfin found all this green, uh, not green, um, gray sludge from paint. It was like rubberized paint down in the filter because that was another thing that happened. And then the sink had gray all over it because they painted everything with gray. And so they were using the sink. The sink garbage disposal discharge side into the U-trap was missing an O-ring. So you had, you had uh, uh, overflowing from the dishwasher for weeks before we bought the house. And then you had this leak going from the U-trap flooding down into uh, the, the cabinet. Underneath the bottom cabinet that you see and use for storage and things, there's another cabinet almost a foot deep. And that's where you can see the, the, the hot and cold pipes and then the drain pipe. And right next to the drain pipe, and I believe I showed this picture before, is the duct, the massive air duct where all that water was going down into that duct, running down from the kitchen uh, supply air supply into the main line and it flooded that whole thing that's why everything was soaking wet down there in the crawl space all the uh, and by the way the insulation was installed backwards you should not see insulation when it's hanging in the underneath in the crawl space that there's a there's a paper facing for the cheapest which builders go for the cheapest insulation and it has flaps that roll out where you staple to hold the insulation up in there. So it was inserted backwards. It got soaking wet, okay, and then it fell down. And it's ruined because it was full of mold. So, uh, again, another issue with code violations we didn't even document because we didn't think of that at the time. Um, I might have that picture here. I believe I did show that before. Um, let me just do a quick perusal through here. I mean, maybe. I doubt. Actually, no. It's not in this one. I know it's not. It is in... Let me get out here to exhibits and baits format. So it's either 15 or it's in 91. One of the two. Um, let's see here. Someone has asked me previously, these holes are uh, three ring binder holes. So when I got this report from Mr. Gafford, he puts his reports, depending on how many pages, he'll put it in a binder. So I, I took it out and make a copy of it. There you go. There's the pictures. That's the mold and the light fixtures. And um, that's absolutely insane. Every single light fixture had mold in it. Every single light fixture. Mr. Garford found that. And that's why when we walked underneath it, it really burned our, our skin, your arms, your hands, because you're just wearing short sleeve shirts. You have no idea what's up in your light fixtures. The builder knew it. He found a note in one of them to say, um, replace all this, uh, the mold infested. This is insulation above and this covers the insulation this is foil and someone had left a note when either electrician or maybe the, the superintendent or Tony Mayer or somebody himself but they said we got to replace all this you know because um, you know if they find it then you know they're gonna get mad at us not that it mattered about our health or our health and safety they just didn't want us getting mad at them what kind of logic is that so anyway, recessed lights emitting mold spores. So this was another thing. These are supposed to be sealed. The, the can light is supposed to be sealed up against the drywall. That's not supposed to be able to be free. And you can see the see what I'm talking about right there? That's where it's supposed to be um, sealed all the way around. Same thing for these things. They weren't sealed. You can see that got soaking wet, and that was mold hyphae. It was uh, penicillin and aspergillus mold right there. And see, this should have been caulked all the way around. So this Mr. Gafford goes mold, mold, mold. 
and it was a lot worse than this. I don't know why he didn't take the picture on the bottom side, which had a big green, pink, and yellow patch. I never understood that. But um, and then the, um, you can see this isn't sealed, so it's like that everywhere. I mean, through the whole house. So I'm trying to find the sink picture now. We did find the light picture. I mean, let me just slow down. Um, I had the person ask me the other day what this was. This, that rough, it doesn't show very well here, but that roughness was mold hyphae pushing the paint out. Uh, and this is in the garage. One of these is in the garage. One of these is in our bedroom, our bathroom, and uh, the center bedroom, and then the bonus room at the other end of the house. So there were several, you can see it's really rough. There were several walls that had this roughness and we didn't know what that was because we'd seen this before we bought the house and they came in and sanded everything down they knew it was mold growing underneath that paint coming out of the drywall pushing the paint out you can see the this is the um, the house coming apart and cracking everything I mean literally just splitting that's the corner just splitting apart that just pulled apart you can see we had to caulk all around the edges here. Uh, I don't know if you can see. It's not really defined. There's caulking up in here. Some of it got repainted by us. You can see that ripped out from the wall. I mean, just literally, that's actually uh, a three, um, three eighths inch or almost a half inch gap. It just doesn't seem like it. But I mean, it's just, just constant everywhere. That crack, that crack. That's absolutely normal. Here's the famous picture. So you can see. There's the duct right there. This is wood. There's wood, hardwood floor, three quarters inch thick, and that forces that water to drain down into that pipe. That's exactly what was happening for weeks before we even knew about it. It's just the, the air. Hand, this is all the mold growing on the wood, and what's called your return air plenum for the main. HVAC system and you're not supposed to have wood in there at all and you can see it's wood and it's cracked and it's got mold in it there's the joist I was talking about they were fractured all the way down the center so I think I said 18 boards that's board 24 so there must have been 27 boards I guess I keep I keep thinking back what I had remembered but every time they came back they found more boards that's why I keep going back to that so this is what's called, this is another thing, in the VA pamphlet 26-7, there's something called minimum property requirements that have to be met that a, uh, I think the VA inspector, I think he sends a pamphlet to us, I'm not sure, but it's important if you're a veteran and you're using your certificate like I did on this house, and that's another reason why I'm fighting, I don't want to lose my certificate, but um, it's important to understand what the minimum property requirements are requirements are and they have it listed out in that book and they even mentioned fungus growth so they they lied to so that's fraud because there's a document that is signed by the builder Let's see if I can find out and the document might be in the 70s here let's see it's it's one for the VA and HUD so when he signs it he's saying you know it meets the approval of the VA and it meets all the requirements of the VA and it, it didn't even come close so I'm trying to see where this might be don't remember what I call it. there it is warranty of completion this is it so this is an important document, uh, warranty of completion of construction to the federal government. You're saying to the federal government, says the undersigned warrant or further warrants to the purchasers, successor transfer of the property against defects in equipment, material, or workmanship, and material supplied or performed by the warrantor, which is the builder, or any subcontractor or supplier at any tier resulting in non-compliance with standards of quality as measured by the acceptable trade practices that says right there by acceptable trade practices this was not acceptable not only that he's signing this document and it says the FHA commissioner or the secretary of the veterans affairs reserves the right to make a final determination as to whether a defect exists and whether the builder must, 
must remedy the defect. So we contacted them to come out and take a look at the house. They did not do it. So now they're on the hook as well. And then purchaser, no, any notice of nonconformity must be delivered to the warrantor within the period of, or periods set forth above. We were not provided any information about the 58 code violations. We actually found more, but we only documented 58 um, and for obvious reasons. You don't need that many to begin with. But this is a fraudulent document. He signed this document. That's fraud against the United States. It's fraud against our government. Who held him accountable for it? Nobody. Not the DOJ, not the FBI. The FBI locally suppressed our case. Now, that's one thing I wanted to show how well documented this is. We gave the FBI and um, Governor Lee, he was involved in our property before becoming Governor Lee Company, was his company, HVAC Company, and they did all the videos for the 17 code violations. 16 were HVAC. There were actually 30 something code violations. We only focused on 16. Um, 16 on HVAC and 1 on plumbing. As you can see, this was a binder sent to Governor Lee. This binder was also sent to him. This is notebook two. We call it uh, case documents, but in here, I, we also have five other properties by John Mayer Builders documented with lot numbers. And we sent paperwork out to these people, not knowing at the time that John Mayer Builders, his corporate name is on our address at the U.S. Post Office. So all of our mail has been, all this time, apparently has been going through them to get to us. So you can see this is very well documented. We did this back in 2018. So this is since then. And we were documenting for fun at first, all the things we were doing. And then we realized we've got to get a little more serious about it and a little more organized. So we did. So you can see, you know, we have contents. We have everything listed in the contents as to what's what. Um, this is communications with Deputy General Counsel Malika Bass. And she's a piece of work because she said she can't investigate bribery, but she did. And she said only the DA's office can do that. And I said, are you going to report to them? She said no. I, I officially requested that she do that, and all three times she officially refused. I have that on audio recording. Um... And this is my response to Malika Bass. I wrote this response and my wife edited the response. I basically called her out on her ludicrous statements and closing out her case when they investigated bribery. We didn't ask them to investigate bribery. We asked them to investigate the contractor's board for failure to uphold our rights. That's what we asked them to do. There's that sill plate I was telling you about. You can see that, that gap there. It's not the sill plate is this board here. That's the sill plate. That's the concrete block. That's the shim. You can see it's not remotely coming close. This is a miniaturized version. I think I have a bigger picture here in the back. Make it easier. But you can see this is a thoroughly taken care of, or, or thoroughly documented. And, and we've talked to everybody. We've got the quorum engineering report in here. He has 40 something pictures and he, he, he called out incompetence on one thing but while he was here he said impossible 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 one of the things that to note here's another thing that happened which was unbelievable he was shocked this is the this is underneath the house and crawl space they sledgehammered out the foundation the support of one end of the of the house which is the other opposite end broke out four feet of the foundation sledgehammered it out there, when you do that, you have to use a saw to cut out the remaining parts and put a metal lintel that goes across there and it has to extend eight inches on each side for support. 
Same thing for the brick on the outside of this past this concrete. They didn't do either one. And then they didn't seal this up. You can see they just put the two, this is HVAC, huge HVAC ducts. They just stuck them in there. And you're supposed to seal this whole thing. You're supposed to put in a foam barrier, okay, and then foam seal it with regular foam. And so it's a, a firm barrier. They didn't do that either. There's a lot of things they don't do that are required by law. So this is the builder, John Muir Builder. So these are all facts, very well documented, and we don't make this stuff up. If we say something to you, it, it's it's we have something to back it up with, uh, or or we've well documented it. Let's see here. I mean, we have so many pictures. Even in our fireplace uh, underneath uh, the. Uh, Ron Corm of Corm Engineering was stunned that he was watching the plastic. We had to seal the whole fireplace with plastic because all that air from the cross space was being blown up. When the house, when it was wind was blowing outside, it blew cross space air up into the house. He wasn't even sure how that was happening. Well, obviously we wouldn't know, but so our outlets were melting. I think uh, hopefully I have a couple of better pictures there. No, I don't. But anyway, this just shows you again how well documented this case is. So we have numerous pictures. This is Uretium gold mold inside the ducts. It's called Uretium. And it eats everything, including you. That's just a picture of the fireplaces. There's dripping coming down both sides of the fireplace, which was the sweating on the walls. It was really bad upstairs, but we couldn't figure it out. But Mr. Gaffer figured out it was all going in the duct down into the main line. He figured it out in October. This is another picture. Now, see, this is a better picture. This is the bigger one. This is slightly bigger. So that's the first one I showed you. You can see the gap is pretty huge. And it went all the way around, which was... The insane. You can see how big that gap is. That's not minor. I mean, that's that's massive. And look, it's it's not even touching the shim. And that shim is um, three eighths of an inch or almost half an inch thick. So that's a big gap. That's scary. So the again, your your house is sitting on the outside edge of all the block. He said eventually the block will collapse inward. Once the first one starts, it's a domino effect, and the whole house will come down, he said, literally in like 30 to 60 seconds, it'll be over. So, that's what we're living with. Our life is in danger, and the judge is doing nothing about it. So here's the insulation I was telling you about. It's hanging down. It's just a small picture. You can't really see it that well, but, um, yeah, it's it was like that everywhere, just hanging down out of there. And most of it was on the floor. So we have outlets that are absolutely, so the, we had a different electrical company come out and they said that the whole house is wired wrong. It's even the grounds aren't grounded. Um, and um, because they had, and we got shocked a couple of times because they had grounded, and while the outlets didn't work, they had grounded the, I don't remember if it was the white wire or the black wire, to the ground. They connected, I'm sorry, they had connected it. Uh, properly, but then ground directly from the white or black to ground. <sighs> Not sure how that happened, but so again, this is more pictures of the mold hyphae. This is a picture of the floor, the wood floor. Mr. Gafford laid it. This is when we really got educated how bad this was. He laid a flashlight down, and all that is mold in the polyurethane consuming it. So the whole floor is like that. Not just that one spot, the whole floor. So that that's what you're dealing with. Again, more gaps. Airflow just coming up out of the crawl space like it's nothing. More and now this is windows outside. Look at the gap right there. I climbed up on the ladder because I didn't know what the black thing was. I was trying to figure it out. When I got up there I realized it was completely open. And that was a C. I think that was February or March of tw of 2018. So we bought the house in 2017. 
So it had been raining in there all winter. And that's why we had to seal plastic over the windows because it burned just to go near them. When you open them thinking, all right, let's just open them to get the mold to air out, it made it a hundred times worse in the house. It made us very ill. Again, we have numerous pictures of the gaps and holes of the windows. This is Meredith Vitality, who worked for Judge uh, for uh, Governor Lee, signing. We got a receipt from her signing for the docu these two binders that went to him, or two like these that went to Governor Lee, and he did nothing about it. He just ignored us. And again, he was involved in our his company, and he were involved in our property. So you can see this is all well documented. We have all these different things. This is A1 waterproofing. I think probably the first report. I'm not sure. It doesn't really say. But, um, and then we did a, uh, we did a whole series here on the proper way to educate people. This is in, this is in notebook two of how the foam is supposed to be done in the crawl space. It's actually supposed to be spray foam, not just a little can and let me just spray around this edge or spray along that edge. No. The whole thing's supposed to be spray foam. And even that shows that. And it even states that. You can see the pink is all that has to be foam sealed all the way across all the materials in your crawl space. Not, not just a little bit here and there. So what they did, they're showing, um, let me see, I've got to pull my glove up. They're showing how the edges here, everything has to be sealed. And one of the things that one of the experts said, uh, expert, um, what, what are they called, um, coach department, people said, you cannot do the bead and expect it to last. You, when you do the solid spray foam, it's going to last. You don't have to worry about it. So they actually changed the codes and required that the whole thing be covered. So that's why, what are they called? Um, to M, the builder is, is uh, not Meredith, I forget what they're called, Meritage, Meritage Homes. They foam sealed the entire attic and the entire crawl space, all of it. Everything's covered. You have a much better installation with them. They, they build real quality homes in my opinion. So you can see this is, you can see the sad face sad face sad face happy face because it was foam sealed with foam over top of that and that works it, because it's not just you don't just put foam up there uh, it's glued in place and again this was done wrong because you're only on that the edge and then you, they left that open here it doesn't help that you do the upper part but you don't do the lower part this is acceptable because you're spraying it but still they're saying you need to do the whole thing. So again, a lot more information. And uh, I'm going to open up the bigger binder, which has a lot more information. And uh, I'm going to finish up this video and get into the next one. So what I'm showing you is every agency has these binders. Has all the inf this is They call this an extreme preponderance of evidence, I guess. Other people don't do this. I have no idea. But again, this was to Governor Lee, um, and this this was a copy for him. So again, it's very well documented. Let's get this. See if I can pull that back. There was a DVD in here, and I see that's missing. That's what they did. They came through the house and they destroyed everything, stole all these copies. We had six sets of two three-ring binders, and they stole all of them September of 2021. Came into, the, not this tent, but another tent, and destroyed four computers, one desktop, three laptops. Took the hard drives out of all of them. Took, went into the house. We discovered later, several months later, when I was trying to cobble together this computer to make something so we'd have something. Um, we discovered all the older computers had the hard drives pulled out of them. And even some of the, the computers were stolen. So this is how invaded we were. 
So that's the table of contents. That's the first tab. Okay, and then it's a letter to Governor Lee. It's 27 pages. They win waterproofing's first report. This is the company's report. This report showed that it has the pricing in here. They just didn't sum it up, so you just have to sum it up. It was twenty-seven thousand something dollars, and um, Bill Lee, Governor Lee, at the time—I mean, Bill Lee at the time, but Governor now—told me that that's just for to bring it up to code. But since that was before they knew that there was mold systemic throughout the property and, and everything, then it changed from twenty-seven something thousand dollars. And then they said it would be about that same amount of money because they would be tearing up the house. And then we'd have to hire a contractor to come back in and redo the house, which would be about 20-something dollars. So we were looking at $55,000 estimated. He said, and that's, that could go, you know, higher five to ten grand more. Just on the HVAC alone, that much money. When we found out that the all the ducks had been... Um, filled with uh, water and all the mold grew in them. He, that's why. They, that's when they came back and said, "Now it's going to be fifty, forty-five to fifty thousand dollars, versus the um, ow. Sorry, um, versus the um, fifty-five to sixty. So then he said, you, you're looking at a lot of tear out in the house because they have to rip out the entire uh, HVAC system and duct system and replace everything. Forty-five to 50000 for that. And he said, you're looking at sixty-five to 75000 in repairing the house. So we're looking at $125,000 just for HVAC. So just keep that in mind. This is how bad this was. So we had, we were given shock after shock after shock with everything that was coming in. So this is the home inspection report, which detailed, I mean, it's very comprehensive. And it detailed, uh, I think, uh, I don't remember how many code, a lot of code violations. I think there were 18 code violations noted in here which were not uh, done as stated. The windows not being caught properly were a code violation. Uh, there's just too many things to cover. We're just gonna move on. Um, I will make the, all this stuff available on the internet um, under these videos. This is the SENI engineering report. This one called out 12 code violations. I remember that on this report alone. And that was a non-invasive and only a, I forget what the term, was that they use um, what do they call it it's like a light a, a, the, the the most basic investigation and they don't even like open up a, a door or a panel to even look behind there to see what's there it's just they come in and do it now they, it costs a lot of money <laughs> they get their money it's uh, 800 and 400 it's like $1200 for the most basic and uh, it took me a month to get the report crazy and it was and the report was wrong and then they were supposed to fix it and then they didn't even fix it right uh, this was the carpet report who failed the inspector failed the carpet uh, completely based on there was construction uh, traffic and on the carpets they were unprotected at the time and uh, oh my goodness sorry Oh, I must be in a, a spot where the mold is coming down and hitting the eye because it's really starting to ping pretty hard now. Try to rush through this. So anyway, they failed the carpet completely because they sanded all the drywall and the ceilings and the walls and the drywall dust got in the carpets and they were matted from then and ruined. Even their subcontractor to talk to the manufacturer and said, yeah, we don't warranty um, carpet that wasn't protected and has drywall dust in it, which means the builder sold us and a uh, carpet that was failed and not warranted another um, violation of the law. That's another uh, criminal act. So 
I forget what these are. Oh, this is just our demand letters that we put together. Um, there were three demand letters that went out to John Mayer, and they just ignored all of them. They're like, yeah, whatever. As you can see, we're still here. So understand, if you're abandoned during at any time during the warranty period, our our warranty was two years, which finally we got a judge to agree it was two years because that's what they signed. Um, if you're abandoned at all, even if it's you know a few days, that's abandonment to breach a contract by law and by case law, uh, bonding authorities, which are in our documentation. So keep that in mind. It's um, I don't know the top of my head the, the two case laws. I used to know it, but a little brain dead. Um, yeah, so Detective Carden, Robert Carden of Spring Hill Police, was required by law to arrest John Mayer upon our request to file charges. Instead, to skirt that, he sent it over to the DA's office and um, only sent the, the demand letters, not our evidence. Therefore, the DA said, well, there's no evidence here, so there's no case. That was intentional on his part because there was undue influence. We found that out, of course, later, a year later, from someone who used to work in the police department and said, oh, yeah, it's corrupt. And, yes, he saw money changing hands, so he left. And this was the original complaint uh, with the Commerce and Insurance and Attorney General's Office and the Contractors Board. We get, you have to file all three. So remember that. You need to file all agencies simultaneously. So do your complaint, you know, with each agency and then file them all this don't file each one individually uh, on different days get them filled out get your evidence together it's the same it should be the same evidence don't ever send one one kind of evidence another one another type whatever evidence you have put it together and send it the same exact evidence to all three okay so a way to protect yourself and whenever you send something always send it certified mail and require a signature always and then take a video of yourself or, or your spouse or whoever or the attorney. Do a slight video showing that they have the information and that they have the cert certificates on them to be mailed, even before they're mailed. And then the stamped copy afterward on a copy that you kept so that it's well documented. And do videos. That way if anything happens to your documentation, at least you have the videos. Here's the larger version of that picture of the sill plate, where sh the very first one I showed you. You can see how large that gap is. I mean, that's this is an inch, I think it was an inch and a quarter or an inch and a half gap between the sill plate, bottom of the sill plate, and that block. I don't even know what the house is sitting on. And this is the larger picture of the other one. You can see it's a massive gap there, too. I mean, you can tell, see the size of that bolt. You can tell that bolt is big. Those are big bolts. They're like, I don't know, 9 or 10 or 12 inches long or something. They go deep down in there. And look at that gap. So the bolt isn't working because there is no, well, they call it grout, but we call it cement. You and I would call it cement. This, all the blocks are supposed to be filled with cement. That was a code requirement in 2012. The new, the new codes are, I think, Spring Hills at 2018 now. Uh, so... They can't get away with this, but they're doing it. So they didn't fill them. And you can see that lifted right up. For that to lift up, that means the house is not bolted to anything. That's why the Franklin, I mean the Williamson County Codes Department, he couldn't come out here because we're in the city of Spring Hill, inside the city limits. So he doesn't cover this. But this, he said, is, is criminal. This is criminal stuff here. Those are his words. It's criminal and that charges should be filed so we did and you can see detective carden deliberately helped the builder this is again more windows you know no caulking missing caulking there's no caulking or it's cracked there this is the caulking wasn't even this is very interesting this is they call it um the williamson county oh let me go back to the williamson county guy Everything that he saw with the, the pictures of the sill plates, the fact that they're lifted, the bolts not holding anything down, no hurricane clips holding the, the roof on, no 
with joist hangers in the crawl space, several fractured boards. He said you could be the big bad wolf and huff and puff and probably blow the house down. He says any st any wind, sustained wind over 60 mile, 55 to 60 mile an hour will move the house. And it has moved several times. We were trapped in the bedroom when we first bought the house. And that's when we brought the first engineering company out, which was SCI Engineering, following April. Um, we could, actually, this is what we learned. Some of these guys are booked up literally three and four months out, and now it might even be worse with the build-out going on. So just keep in mind, people aren't going to be readily available. And it's, it, this is what took us so much time to get all these reports because it took time to get them scheduled to come out. And, and the judges, you tell them that, and it goes in one ear and out the other. It's almost like it's intentional. Again, just more pictures, a lot of documentation, all these unsealed penetrations in the crawl space that were supposed to be sealed, foam sealed, and they were not. That's the punch list. Fireplace again. So we have the bigger pictures in the back here. Okay, damaged insulation that says water problem. And we didn't know at the time that the water from the sink and the uh, garbage disposal was leaking down into the crawl space and into the ducts. Didn't know that. There you go, there's that picture showing the it's soaking wet. The insulation is in put in backwards. You can see it's all hanging down. This is the remnants. A lot of this had already fallen out. A, a good portion of it. It was like over 60% the MTM and our guys mold remediation company came out and half of the more than half of the insulation was laying on the uh, vapor barrier. And the vapor barrier was supposed to be installed six inches up and taped to the wall glued and taped and it was two feet away from the wall all the way around allowing all the moisture to, on top of that to get up you can see this is what the mold did to this is the insulation for ducts in the crawl space you can see what the mold was doing to it it was eating it and that's what mr gafford said because that's what you're seeing that rust colored is your tin mold was eating right through it and i don't remember what the, oh this is the entry the 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 block before you go underneath the fireplace that was wide open it was supposed to be completely sealed again lots of joists split down the middle here here and the white is zinger and uh, zinger paint and kills and it does not kill the mold and worse it doesn't kill the mycotoxins and it doesn't stop sporing when you spray it on stuff it makes the mold spore worse and the mycotoxins are still active these products are not made as they were supposed to be that's pictures of me going in the crawl space and starting to remediate the mold and painting the joist we were told it would stop the mold from sporing and stop the mold from growing it didn't one of the suits, the reason why I'm so ill today, one of these suits, they're, they're completely, see, you can see I've got a mask, and it's a chemical mask to handle chemicals and mold and all that. It, it usually, on average, took me 14 hours to do that entire crawl space by myself. 14 hours in that suit, sweltering, for real, it's like a sauna. And um, you can't go to the restroom, you can't do anything else, you have to get it done. And one of the suits was porous. It was made wrong. So all that mold got into the suit, got into me. Sauna, perfect wet environment. And I spent four days in the hospital and I almost died from it. I was broke out with mold all over me, head to toe. Eyes swollen shut, nasal passage, everything swoll swollen up. That's a bigger picture of what I was showing you earlier. The mold in the growing out of the uh, hardwood floors. You can see the water spots. This is actual water when we were walking on the floors from the the garbage disposal overflowing. I mean the not garbage disposal, the dishwasher overflowing, and then the garbage uh, disposal or the sink you trap linking leaking, and it was flowing out underneath the floor as well. So that's just that's water just sitting on the floor as we're walking across it. We're just like, what, how is that possible? With this, Mr. Gafford says, this is how you see cupping. I think he called this cupping. And all the boards are raising and swelling from all the moisture. And this is that mold hyphae.
growing through the wall, out of the growing through the paint out of the wall. Is a better picture worse? You can see that that's really bad. And basically, the it's just consumed the paint completely, and all that is coming out on us daily. That's just another picture of it. Another one. This is a brand new filter for the HVAC system. This is a week later. Brand new. Week later. For real. One week. That's how bad the 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 air was in the house. This is uh you know it's a filter that's bigger than the vent, the ceiling vent. You can see what happened. I think that was so you can see it says five eight nineteen. And um so that we usually had to replace them, you know, we were doing uh weekly replacing these filters weekly. So we'd have we'd have to we put up a metal thing up there so we could tape to the metal and then peel it off easy. And we had we had uh, stripped all the light fixtures of the insulation because it was uh just hard. But then we realized afterward the reason why the light fixtures got the mold in it was because it was already up above in the attic and in the insulation that they put in the attic. So and that's another picture again of the uh filters what they look like. This is what we were living in. And and so we haven't run the HVAC systems, Mr. Gafford and even the C D C that we talked to said shut them off. Shut off the HVAC. Don't run them ever again. Because all you're doing is con further contaminating the property and making yourself more ill. But it really didn't help to shut everything off. So this is plastic on the floors uh, because the mold's coming up through the floors. And we couldn't figure out why and where the pressure was coming from. When you run your dryer and the pipe that goes from the dryer exhaust underneath the floors and out isn't sealed because they didn't seal it. They didn't tape it together. It puts pressure, that air pressure, pressurizes all the floors in between and pushes all the mold that's growing inside there because all the moisture that was in the house and the moisture from your dryer exhaust feeds mold. You know the, the constant, you know, what happened afterward. Again, bigger picture, closer up of the broken um, separated uh, trim all throughout the house. So again this is well documented and you can see these posts were cracked excessively. Um, we ended up having to replace I think this one and that one which cost money. Lots of money. It's like $800 for two posts. It's crazy. Again this is us this is in the house. This is our bedroom. So at the time, we should have had tarps over the bed. We didn't know. We just put sheets up and plastic on the ceiling. And you can see I'm sitting there in a painter's suit. And I've been in a painter's suit ever since 2018. Every day. So think about that. Without it, I'd be dead. I honestly would be. So you can see there's plastic covering everything. It's much worse now. It's like a dungeon. It's like uh, Adam's family home, for real. And if anybody wants a live me to carry the computer through the property and see this live, put that in the comments. And I'll set up a date and time for everybody to come in and see the horror of what that house really looks like. And what they did is they came in and ransacked the house. We left it just like it was. Ransacked, went through all the boxes, tossed them everywhere. We actually, we stacked the boxes kind of on top of each other, but they, they took out contents, all kinds of stuff, and just uh, basically made a mess of the house, and we left it that way. This is just um, pictures of me ill. My face is all swollen and broken out. Now, my hair turned red. Our pots and pans turned black, or even, even not just pots and pans, our silverware, and um, our hair turned orange. My wife's did, mine did, the cat's, he's black, he turned orange. Whatever was going on in this house turned everything orange. That's, my leg was uh, infected with mold from there to there. That was, that was this one. I had mold infections on my back uh, and certain other areas that we couldn't disclose, obviously. And then that's mold on my back, the torso, the hand, all at once. 
it was very painful. My wife's legs and her knee just swelled up from the mold. And I found out why. There's The knees have a membrane that actually breathes. And most of us aren't taught that. This is our poor little kitty. He is alive. He is healthy and well now. But that's what he was suffering with. Tremendous pain. You can see how miserable he is. He was absolutely miserable. The doctor wanted to put him down, but I knew we could save him. So that gives you a perspective of how well documented the case is. And for, for whoops, my bad. For Judge Hood to make the statement that the case had to be tried after Judge Frierson said um, the, the case speaks for itself, the evidence speaks for itself, it is a preponderance of evidence and that they have ruled several times before based on a preponderance of evidence without having to go through a whole trial. I'm not sure what just happened, but anyway, um, I've been wanting to, I keep telling people, they keep asking, you know, can you show us the evidence that you had, can you, how you did X, Y, and Z, and now I've done that today to help people understand, but I also wanted to show that I did file charges through the various agencies, oh, I'll have to clean that up later, um, to show um, people were saying that we were making things up, that I was making things up, that we weren't filing charges and that we weren't doing this, that, and the other, and we weren't talking to the FBI and all this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. We don't talk to the FBI. You send them information. You file a complaint, send them information. Have I talked to them? Yeah, we talked to Agent Casper Cromwell, Agent Caesar Cesar, Agent Richard Baer, um, another agent. I don't remember his name. But um, they suppressed our case. They sat on it and did nothing with it, and uh, I call that intentional. That's malicious harm, because they are part of the problem why we're still here, so keep that in mind. So if your own um, legal, or not legal, your own Department of Justice and your, your own FBI doesn't support you, and the local court doesn't support you, and the local law enforcement doesn't support you, what does that say to you? Please comment. Tell me what that means to you. I would like feedback from everyone. I know what it means to me and my wife, but I'm not going to share right now what it is. But I know what it means. I know what it is. I know what that statement is. I know what statement they are making to us directly by not doing anything. And keep in mind, I've been told over and over by numerous law firms, there is a good old boy network. Very, very well, well dug in here. But I've been told recently by... Um, I don't know what to call them, other people that are in the know, that it's this has caused a huge disruption with what they were doing and what they were getting away with for years. Everyone's um, stopped doing it to a certain extent. That's all I know. I don't know what that means or how in-depth that is, but that's all I have for today. Um, if you have any questions, you know, again, you know, just to... You can send comments on the videos themselves. Have a good day.